In this video, I'm going to take you guys in depth with the Creality K1 Max. And if you guys are looking for more info about the regular K1, I've already covered that in a separate video. And you can find a link to that in the top right hand corner of the screen right now. Or after you finish watching this video, you can head on over into my channel and find it yourself. And so if you guys aren't already aware, the K1 Max is the bigger brother to the smaller K1. So it's got a large build volume of 300 millimeters in every single axis. And it's got a lot of similar features to the K1, like the Core XY motion system, uh, direct drive print head, triple lead screw Z axis, and this very nicely polished enclosure here. But it does feature a few premium upgrades over the regular K1, uh, such as the built-in camera, a LiDAR sensor, it's got a glass lid on top instead of a plastic one, and there's an exhaust filter on the back. We'll take a closer look at all of those features in this video. We've got a lot of stuff to get through. We're gonna do a head-to-head -head comparison between Prusa Slicer and Creality Print. I've got a lot of test prints, some upgrades available for this printer, and we'll take a closer look at the LiDAR sensor as well. So let's get started. We'll start with the unboxing, and this thing is big. So big, in fact, that it arrived on my front doorstep in a small wooden crate. And that's a good thing because, as we'll see here in a second, there are some glass panels. This one in particular, on the very top of the package, is the top panel of the printer, and it's glass. And that panel arrived in one piece, as did the rest of the printer, where the front door is also made of glass. The side panels appear to be made of some sort of acrylic, perhaps, and so those also arrived undamaged. And the printer as a whole looks very nicely packaged with all the accessories inside of the main enclosure. In the small shallow box, you'll find some tools and accessories, including a USB stick, these side cutters here, some hex keys and screwdrivers, as well as this scraper, a wrench, a tool for clearing the hot end, some glue stick, and some maintenance lubricant. Creality also gets you up and running right away with their Hyper Series PLA in white, and it's a full roll. In this section of the foam, you'll also find the door handle, a spool holder, and a small box with a spare hot end, which I thought was a pretty generous addition because if you ever have a problem, then you won't be waiting on those replacement parts from Creality. And finally, in that foam, you'll find some rubber feet that go on the bottom of the machine. Over here, you'll find the power cable. And finally, there is the touch screen that goes on the front of the printer. The K1 Max, similar to its smaller counterpart, the K1, requires very little in terms of assembly. One of the few things you have to do here is attach the front touchscreen. And on the back of the screen, you'll find a connector, and on the front of the printer, you'll find the mating connector on a ribbon cable. Don't pull too hard on that ribbon cable, just carefully plug it into the back of the screen, and then you'll find these notches in the printer, and you'll find the mating notches on the back of the screen. You just push in and then push straight down, and that screen should be secure now in place. Next up is the door handle, and this is also very straightforward. The package comes with this steel backing, which we used to magnetically latch the door shut, and there are two of these bushings and two screws. Insert the bushings through the holes, insert the screws through the bushings, put the handle on the front, and screw it all together. Now we're ready to plug in our machine, and unlike the smaller K1, there's no voltage selector, so you don't have to worry about that. You can simply plug it in, turn the machine on, and then follow the on-screen prompts. You'll select your language, and then it will tell you to remove the three screws inside of the enclosure, which are clearly marked with these yellow stickers. And you can use the included wrench to do that. And then you can also remove the clear protective cover from your print bed. Once you're done with that, you can continue on with the prompts and you'll set up your wireless network. You can also select your time zone. And then if you choose, you can bind it with Creality Cloud. I'm gonna skip that for now and I'm gonna proceed right to the self-inspection. The machine will take over from here and put itself through a series of self-checks for nozzle heating, hotbed heating, heat brake fan, mainboard fan, input shaping, and then finally the auto bed leveling procedure. This whole process will take a few minutes, so just be patient. You will notice the print head flying around, probing the print bed, and when it's doing that input shaping, it will be vibrating. And after that's done, you'll likely be prompted to update the firmware. I'm going to go ahead and do that. And then at the back of the machine, we can remove some of those labels. 
the very basic spool holder just twists into place. However, my experience with this style of spool holder on the smaller K1 was not so great. You can see the residue from the cardboard spools building up on there. There's a lot of friction. So I'm gonna replace it with one of these super deluxe spool holders that you can find on my website, embracemaking.com. It installs the exact same way by just inserting and twisting into place. And it even comes with this small spanner wrench where you can make that last half turn to get it fully tightened and now we have a low friction solution for our high speed printer. And we're gonna be loading it up with this Creality Hyper PLA in red. The spool is secured on the spool holder with this conical nut. And now that spool will roll on center rather than rolling and dragging eccentrically like it would have on the basic spool holder. I'm gonna route the filament according to the diagram that's included on the back of the printer. Apparently they don't want you doing it the other way. Then I'll remove the PTFE tube by pushing down on the white fitting, pulling the tube up. I'll pull the last little bit of filament out. I'll unlock the extruder and then guide the filament down through the extruder, push the PTFE tube back in and then relock the extruder. I won't be using the top lid while printing PLA, but if you do want to install it, it just sits on top. At this point, it's also a good idea just to get familiar with the user interface on the front touchscreen. Take a minute and flip through all of the options and explore for yourself. You can find in the system settings the version of firmware you have. In the camera section, you can enable time-lapse photography and there's an AI function menu where you should be able to enable the AI print failure detection using the camera. There's also a motion advanced setting, which I believe uses the LiDAR sensor and we'll investigate that a little more later. K1 Max also has its own internal memory, which comes preloaded with some test prints. This is where you can also access the files on the USB thumb drive if you have one plugged in. And over in the control section, we can set things like our nozzle temperature, our print bed temperature, and we can load up some filament by heading into this menu here and hitting extrude. The nozzle will preheat to 230 degrees Celsius, and then it will automatically start extruding. And you'll see some of that red Creality Hyper PLA that we loaded in start to come out. Now the nozzle is primed and we're almost ready to start printing. Have a look inside of your enclosure and just don't forget to remove the lens cover from the camera so that the camera doesn't look blurry. In my first video with the regular K1, I pretty much just dismissed Creality Print and skipped right to Prusa Slicer. But since then, there has been some updates to Creality Print, so let's give it a chance here. In the top right corner, we can use the drop down menu and we can select to add a new printer. I'll be adding the K1 Max and it's got a 0.4 millimeter nozzle being used. So I'll just hit OK. I can just drag and drop a STL file directly into the workspace. And we're gonna be printing this low poly Charmander. And any of the files that we're printing in this video, I'll link to them in the video description down below. So be sure to check that out. After doing a quick inspection on this part, it looks like we can print without supports. So on the right hand side, we can double click on the print profile and that's gonna bring up these various options. We can toggle the advanced button and access even more settings. And I'm not gonna make any major changes here. I'm just gonna reduce the infill percentage because this is really a non-functional part and it'll reduce the amount of film we use and decrease the print time. I'll leave all of these standard print speeds in the support section. I won't touch anything there because again, we're not using supports. For the material, the only thing I'm gonna change here is I'm gonna increase the print bed temperature to 60 degrees Celsius. Based on my testing with the smaller K1, 45 degrees was not hot enough, especially on that print bed that comes with the K1 and K1 Max, where they tell you to use glue stick. I'm gonna avoid using glue stick and just increase the temperature to 60 degrees on the print bed. I'll slice the file and everything looks pretty good. On the bottom right corner of the screen, we can click on LAN printing. Creality Print will prompt you for a file name so I'll just change that to something a little shorter because this is what's going to appear on the user interface on the K1 Max. And we can scan our network for a printer. And again, we've already connected this printer to the network in the setup. I can select my K1 Max and then I can click on one click printing and it'll just send it and start printing right away. Or I can just click on send it G code and you'll see it'll send the G code and then it's up to you to head on over to the printer and use the interface to start printing. Alternatively, you can press the device button at the top of the screen and you can access this screen here where you can remotely control your K1 Max. 
You can see your file list, import other files. You can control the nozzle temperature, the hotbed temperature, where I'm gonna just preheat it to 60 degrees. You can also see the live output from the onboard camera, and you'll get your temperature graph down here. You'll see that start to populate as the hotbed preheats. Over at the printer on the touch screen, if I hit the file list, you'll see the Charmander file come up, and I've labeled it PLA with a suffix of CP, meaning Creality Print, because in a moment after we print using Creality Print, we're gonna be transferring all of those file settings over to Prusa Slicer, and we're gonna be comparing these two prints printed with the two different slicers. And this is the legitimate first print on this machine. I did not do any practice runs. The first layer is going down very well. You can see it's using a brim for additional first layer adhesion. The print went off without a hitch. It was pretty quick. And during this whole process, I was able to remotely view the print in progress with Creality Print in that device section. And I had a second time-lapse camera capturing the whole thing just for a different angle. After a bit of cool down time, the print released off of the flex plate without any issue. And I was very surprised. The quality looked very nice coming out of Creality Print. And we'll take a closer look at this model under a better light after we're finished printing with the Prusa Slicer version. Now that model took two hours and 17 minutes to print, which was pretty close to what Creality Print had estimated. Now I've loaded the same model into Prusa Slicer and I've manually transferred over all of the print settings from Creality Print to Prusa Slicer, the best that I could translate them from one to the other because not everything is exactly the same. I'm gonna make this profile available on my website, embracemaking.com. I'll put a link down in the video description below. So go check that out if you wanna try using Prusa Slicer. I'm not gonna go through every single setting in this video, but basically, again, I have transferred over all of these settings the best that I could and I haven't changed anything that would affect the print time or quality. I've tried to make this as equal of a comparison as possible. In the printer settings, I've got the G-code thumbnails set up so that they should show up on the touch screen. And in the custom G-code section, I've got the basics in there where the print should start and end without any issues. As for the machine limits, I've got the feed rates and accelerations being used to estimate the print time only. They will not be sent to the printer to control those things. All of that will be done in the print settings. In the extruder settings, I am gonna change the retraction length to one millimeter. And this has been based on my testing with the smaller K1, because as far as I can tell, the K1 and K1 Max have very similar print heads. This is a divergence from the Creality print settings, but again, this is based on my testing, and maybe there's just some small difference between how the two slicers handle retractions. So we're gonna stick with that. And in the PLA settings, we're not gonna really change much from what I had with the original K1 settings. And so I'm gonna reuse all of my K1 PLA settings. Now we can slice our file, export our G code. And looking at the sliced information, the estimated print time is slightly longer than Creality Print, but the used filament looks to be about the same. Having a look at the cross section, it looks very close to the Creality Print output, so that's good. Now to get this file onto the K1 Max, we can head over to our web browser and type in the IP address of our K1 Max and gain access to the web user interface. Unfortunately, we can't send files directly from Prusa Slicer because the Moonraker server is not running as far as I can tell. So we're gonna use the import button on the web UI, find our G-code file, and then import it. And before we start this print, I just wanna point out to the right of the file list, we can see a graphical representation of the surface topology of our print bed. And this comes from the auto bed leveling measurements. My print bed looks a little high in the center. It's definitely not completely flat. Now it's not the worst I've ever seen, but it's not the best either. Later in this video, we will print some larger objects to make sure the auto bed leveling can account for this. On the touch screen, we can see that the small G-code thumbnail works, but when we go to click on it, the larger one still doesn't. I'm gonna have to look into that a little more, but for now, I'll hit print. With the Prusa Slicer G-code output, everything appears to be going normally. The only thing that I've noticed is that the big auxiliary side fan is not being used for part cooling as it was being used with the Creality Print version. Nonetheless, the print finished in two and a half hours roughly which was only a few minutes longer than the Creality Print version, slightly less than the estimated time within Prusa Slicer. And the finished part looks almost identical to the Creality Print version, 
I did notice a few extra wisps of filament that did need to be cleaned up, but it was a very small job. So on the left hand side here, I've got the Creality Print version. On the right hand side, the Prusa Slicer version. And we're gonna take a direct head to head look at the two. And you can see here that the Creality Print version was using the brim as I pointed out earlier and it had placed the seam on the side of the print, which I wasn't too happy about. But otherwise, the surface quality of the Creality Print version is absolutely excellent. The surfaces are extremely smooth and there are zero strange artifacts on this print. The Prusa Slicer result is nearly identical, although I would give an edge to the Creality Print version on the surface quality. On the Prusa Slicer one, I do like the position of the Z seam a lot better. Uh, however, again, just by comparing the two side by side, the surface quality is slightly better on the Creality Print version. I'm going to have to do some digging into why that is. I've looked at some of the more obvious things like the G-Code resolution. haven't noticed anything different really going on there that would make this sort of an impact. Now, by no means is the Prusa Slicer version bad. If I had not have printed one using Creality Print, Honestly, I would have been perfectly fine with the Prusa Slicer output, but having seen the two side by side, there is a small but noticeable difference. Perhaps having that side auxiliary fan running for the entire print does make a very big difference in model quality. However, I can't say that for sure and it's just speculation at this point, but because of the great quality that I've gotten from Creality Print, we're going to do a few more tests. So this time I brought in a different model that's going to require some supports. I do want to compare and test the difference between the Creality Print and Prusa Slicer supports. And so what we'll do is we'll start off by selecting the model in Creality Print and then we'll head over to the menu bar on the left hand side and click on support. In this menu we can add automatic support, we can add custom supports, but for now we need to first enable the supports. In the support tab of the print settings, we're going to click on generate support and we're going to be using the tree supports. And I'm also going to get rid of the auto brim in the build plate adhesion section. Beyond that, we're just going to be using all of the other default settings. Nothing special here. On the underside of the model, you may notice some faint red highlights and it looks like Creality Print has identified the severe overhangs that will require support. Now I'm going to slice this file and we'll have access to the print preview where we can see those tree supports have been generated and we can see that I'm still using the grid style infill and the output should look similar to the first model since I haven't really changed any of those other settings. And the estimated print time is four and a half hours. So we'll rename our file and send it to the K1 Max over Wi-Fi. And as much as I love Prusa Slicer, the convenience of sending directly from Creality Print to the K1 Max has me really warming up to Creality Print. I'd like to start trying to use it more frequently, but one of the sticking points for me is how it's going to handle supports, and that's part of the reason why we're doing this model right now. While the model's printing, I was happy to see that the support material was going down just fine. The tree supports weren't too fragile that they were getting knocked over during the process, and the rest of the model was looking on par with the Charmander that we first printed. And again, by using Creality Print during this whole process, the auxiliary side part cooling fan was being used and the print time was four hours and 26 minutes. So the Creality Print estimate was completely accurate. First impression off the print bed, the part looks very good. However, I am noticing that the supports are a little more difficult to remove than my experience with removing supports from Prusa Slicer in the past. So we'll do another head-to-head -head comparison here and you can see I've loaded up the same model in Prusa Slicer and I'm going to be using the paint on supports and I'm going to be manually identifying all of the areas which I feel need support on this model. This manual process does take a little bit of time and practice and as you get more familiar with your machine you'll be able to intuitively figure out how much you can get away with. When slicers automatically generate supports Usually they're very conservative and you get a lot more support material than what you really need. Now in this case, I'm still getting familiar with the K1 Max and I'm using those organic supports, which are basically the same as tree supports. And you can see here that it's pretty heavy on the support side. It's having a pretty big impact on the overall print time and the support material alone is almost taking two hours. So an hour and 40 minutes. Part of that has to do with the support density, but another part of it is probably the support speed settings, which I'll play around with a little later. 
For now, my concern is just getting this print completed successfully without knocking over any of those supports and figuring out how easy it's gonna to be to remove those supports and the quality of the surfaces on top of the support material. And so the actual print time here was about an hour and a half longer than the Creality print version. But despite that, it doesn't look like the extra print time has contributed to any higher quality surfaces than we experienced the first time. It's about on par with the same experience as with those first models. However, the big difference here is the surfaces that are on top of the support material. So this one here is the Creality print version and those supported surfaces are pretty rough. I had to really pick away the support material with a set of needle nose pliers to get it off. Although this is mostly hidden on the underside of the model, I feel that it still takes away from the overall part quality, which is really too bad because the rest of the part looks excellent. And so I'm gonna have to play around with those support settings in Creality Print a little more to get the result that I was looking for. This seems to be one area where the default settings are a bit insufficient. Now in contrast, the supported surfaces from the Prusa Slicer print were excellent. Despite having gone a bit heavy on those supports, they all broke off very easily and there were no unsightly signs of support or stringing underneath the model. I saved a piece of the support material from the Prusa Slicer version and this was the part that goes under the tail and you can see the top layer, so the interface layer of that support material was very solid. I wasn't able to save any of the pieces from the Creality Print version because they all came off into tiny fragments, but in the future, I'm gonna play around with those Creality Print settings to try and emulate the same sort of interface layer that I was able to achieve with Prusa Slicer. Other than that, the rest of the Prusa Slicer model looked very nice. Although I would still give the edge to the Creality Print version when it comes to those outer perimeters, there's some very slight inconsistencies on this model here versus the very smooth outer appearance of the Creality Print version. Moving on to a few more prints, this time with different brands of material, still PLA, but in a matte gray, I'm printing some of these long bars. Earlier in this video, I pointed out that my print bed looked a little high in the center, so I printed this bar diagonally, front to back, and side to side to see if I would have any issues with the auto bed leveling. In each case, the print was successful. I didn't have a single failed print, and you can see the results. On this piece here that was printed on a 45 degree angle, you can see that the top solid infill ended up going straight across. I don't really like how that looks, but that's a setting that can be changed in the slicer. The important thing is that the numbers on top came out clear and easy to read. The text on the side wasn't as clear to read, however it is much smaller and I wasn't really crazy about the Z seam position on the bar that was printed at a 45 degree angle. This one here was printed side to side along the X axis and it looks very comparable. Obviously the top solid infill is a bit different, the numbers on the side are similar in quality to the first bar. The Z seam was put on a corner, which was a lot better to look at. And moving on to the bar that was printed front to back, we have pretty much the exact same thing. Now the auxiliary fan was blowing on those numbers and it didn't seem to have any sort of impact on the quality or crispness of the text on the side, which is a bit unfortunate because truthfully, I have seen this exact part come off other printers looking a little nicer but I also have a feeling that it has something to do with this matte gray filament. I personally found that matte gray filament never seems to look quite as good as some other colors. So then I went ahead and tried some of the Hyper PLA in white from Creality. And although it looks very nice in person, it's very hard to see on camera. So I figured I'd switch back to the Hyper PLA in red and try and blow through an entire roll of it. I started printing all sorts of random things, some functional, some not, and eventually I came to a part where I finally ran into an issue. I started knocking over some of these tall, thin parts, and they don't have a whole lot of surface area anchoring them to the print bed. This makes them inherently unstable. Luckily, the solution was very simple, and all I had to do was disable the Z-hop in the slicer settings, and then I tried an even more challenging part. These here were done in black PLA, and they're even taller and even thinner. Thankfully, I didn't have to use a brim because I hate having to remove those post-print. 
And another contributing factor to the better first layer adhesion on those tall thin parts is that I switched over to one of my custom magnetic flex plates. You can find these double-sided PEI flex plates on my website embracemaking.com and going forward in this video, I'm gonna be using the textured side of this plate. No glue stick is necessary and my experience with the smaller K1 was that eventually the prints stopped sticking to the original Creality build plate. After switching over on my smaller K1, I did the same on the K1 Max and just never looked back. Having the textured build plate is also pretty awesome for adding some character to the surfaces that are touching the build plate, as you can see here with this dual colored filament. And so this provides a nice segue into discussing some of the available upgrades that I have for the K1 Max. We just looked at these custom double-sided PEI flex plates that are a direct drop-in replacement for the original. The one side is textured so we can get that nice looking pattern transferred over to our printed parts. These flex plates require no glue, unlike the original on the K1 and K1 Max, and I've been using them on the printers in my print farm for hundreds and hundreds of prints. I also wasn't entirely content with the very simple spool holder on the back of the printer. As you can see, it doesn't offer a smooth rotation of the spools, and if you're using these cardboard spools, there's a lot of friction on that surface from the spool dragging on it. So instead, I installed one of these super deluxe spool holders that I offer on my website, and it has the exact same twist lock feature from these Creality spools. Therefore, it's compatible with the K1 and K1 Max, as well as any of the Creality printers that use these twist lock spool holders. With this design, there's a reduction in the amount of force that the extruder is required to pull that roll of filament. Now to take things a step further, I also designed this spool stand. And this is called the Spool Stand X. And this can be used on more than just the K1 and K1 Max. If you look at the two top corners of the Spool Stand X, what you'll find is that you can accessorize with things like mounting provisions for Creality Runout sensors, as well as this PTFE tube guide. Both of these are on ball joints to make sure that the filament is never being pulled at weird angles. On the back of the Spool Stand, you'll notice these black rubber feet and that's because the Spool Stand X can also be run in the vertical orientation. I did this specifically for the Creality K series, so you can take this Spool Stand and you could put it directly on top of the lid of the printer, and those rubber feet would not allow the spool to move while the printer is vibrating. On the K1 Max, you can see I've taken a piece of PTFE tube and looped it around the back of the printer up into the Spool Stand X. This eliminates the sharp bend in the tube when it used to be pointed down towards the original location of the spool holder, and this also frees up a lot of space at the back of the printer. Now this setup has worked out very well for me, but you can also run the Spool Stand X on the side of the printer. But either way, whether it's the top or the side, it makes access to your materials so much easier than having to go to the back of the printer every time you want to change your filament. I'm not sure what motivated Creality to put the spool holder on the back of the machine, but at least now with the Spool Stand X, you can also gauge how much material you have left on your spool. I also replaced the section of tube going from the extruder to the filament run with detection sensor with the same blue low friction PTFE tube. You can find this low friction PTFE tube on my website. It comes in rolls of two meters and you get a tube cutter. The tube cutting tool makes it easy to get nice straight cuts, which makes for much smoother connections with those push lock fittings. And with two meters of tube length, you get enough to do everything I just showed you on the K1 Max, plus enough left over to use on another printer if you have one. Another mod that I've done on my K1 and will be doing shortly on the K1 Max is a hardened steel nozzle. I'll put a link to the installation video in the top right hand corner of the screen and this is another product that you can find on my website, fits both the K1 and the K1 Max and I've been printing a lot of carbon fiber PET G with my K1 lately. The hardened steel resists the abrasive wear of the carbon fiber filaments and after many many prints now on the K1, the parts coming off of it are still looking amazing. And so after this video, the K1 Max will be getting the exact same treatment. Lastly, I've noticed that the K1 Max, despite being a much larger printer than the K1, comes with the same size LED strip lighting up the interior of the printer. I figured I could do better, so I'm going to make available this plug and play solution where it's an aluminum framed LED bar with a diffused lens. It has a nice daytime color temperature as well as a very respectable color rendering index of 90. 
This will produce a nice soft natural light compared to the originals and because of the good CRI rating, the objects inside of the enclosure will look much better. The colors will look normal and natural and this will be easy on your eyes and it'll look great in photography or videography if you're sharing your projects on social media. And so if you're interested in any of these upgrades, please visit my website embracemaking.com. And since we're talking about LEDs, I've got this small project that I've been waiting to build using the K1 Max and some RGB LEDs. It started with a request to build a light up magic wand. And now that I'm looking at it, it evolved to be more of a royal magic scepter than perhaps a wand, but whatever you want to call it, I think the K1 Max will be the perfect platform to build it on. And if you guys are looking for these files, I'll put them on my printables page. For the top and bottom of this magic scepter, I'm going to be using this dual colored PLA from D3D. This filament color shifts from bluish purple to purplish pink, and this shifting color, in my opinion, adds to the magic nature of this project. And if you guys have never printed in dual color PLA, there's nothing special you have to do here. I set it up with the regular PLA profile in Creality Print, and the parts turned out just as nice as any of the solid colors that I printed with earlier. After that, I moved on to some clear PLA to print all of the jewels. The large jewel or gem at the top of the scepter is only two layers thick and the rest of it is hollow on the inside to allow the LED light to shine through. And despite this print being only two walls thick, it still felt reasonably strong and I think that's because of its shape. Hopefully I won't have to print a replacement for a while and the rest of the jewels were printed with some infill because no light will be shining through. And now that I have all the parts printed, I'm going to show you the light source. And it's just this LED lantern that I got from my local dollar store. And so when I take it apart, I get the RGB module on the inside with a battery holder on the bottom. We'll come back to this part a little bit later. And I just want to show you from the same dollar store, I also picked up this plastic shovel. And we're going to be using the tube in the middle, which is just shy of 24 millimeter outer diameter. We're also going to need three AAA batteries. And there's two more of these very simple gray 3D printed parts that will go inside of the assembly. In terms of hardware, we have a few Panhead M3 screws that are intended to thread into plastic. I'll put the sizes up on the screen right now as well. We'll begin by taking the main frame of the scepter and we'll be inserting the small jewels on the side. So we're gonna take those jewels, put them in the pockets, and we're gonna be using the M3 by six thread forming screws to hold them in place. These screws will cut their own threads into the plastic, so it makes assembly very easy and you won't have to tap any holes. I love using these screws for my 3D printed parts because they also have alternating high and low threads to prevent cracking and splitting of the parts. So we're going to repeat this for four of those gems going around that main frame, and then we can take our LED module, we can insert our three AAA batteries, and we're going to be installing the gray cover on top of those batteries. You'll notice the gray cover has a tab on the side and it has a notch. The notch will go over top of the power button and the tab will go inside of one of the slots in this module. Right now there's really nothing holding in place but the tube will eventually press down on that circular pocket and keep it from falling out. Right now I'll place it inside of this large gem and I'll line up the four holes in the module with the four holes in the bottom of the gem. Now the main frame also has four of these tabs with holes and that will sit on top and we'll line up those holes. Then I can grab my M3 by 20 millimeter long thread forming screws and start putting those in the holes and just simply threading them in. They'll bite into the slightly undersized holes of the gemstone and that will clamp the whole assembly down and secure everything in place. I'll repeat this process for the remaining three screws and you can see that I'm avoiding tipping this assembly over so the gray cover on the inside doesn't fall out of position. With this part of the assembly together, you should still be able to access the power button with your finger through the frame. And now we can take the tube and push it down through the hole. And that's gonna press up against that gray cover and hold it down in place. Now I can grab my drill and drill some pilot holes into the purple tube using the holes in the frame as my guide. And I'll be using these M3 by eight thread forming screws. And those will bite into that plastic and hold the tube in place. There's a total of three of these screws at the top of the frame, and when you're done, it should look something like this. Then we can move on to the bottom of the tube. So this is the bottom frame, for lack of a better term, of this scepter. The one side has a chamfered edge, and this is where this other small jewel will sit, 
and it has a hole in the bottom. So we can set down on the table like this. We can grab our gray plastic washer, put one of our M3 by 12 thread forming screws through the washer, and we can guide that down through this bottom frame piece. And you can see the M3 by 12 screw sticking out. We'll thread that into the bottom jewel. And that'll hold that down in place. This small assembly will now slip onto the bottom of the tube. And we're gonna repeat the same process we did at the top where I'll take my drill, drill a few pilot holes, use the M3 by eight thread forming screws to secure this bottom frame member to the tube. And just like the top, there's a total of three of those screws. And when I'm finished that, the whole assembly has been completed. I really like the way the colors shift on the dual filament and we can now test out the LEDs by pressing the button on the bottom and you can see that every single press changes colors on those RGB LEDs and as you cycle through the various colors on this particular module here you eventually get into some patterns where it goes through fading and strobing so it's a fun little toy for a special little someone who I know is going to be very excited to receive it. I'll do my best to find the same LED module online and link to that on my printables page because this one also has a small remote where you can change the colors wirelessly with the remote, which is a nice little touch as well. And if you don't tell your kid about the remote, it really does make it seem like it's magic. With that project out of the way, we can jump into printing some PETG, which is a material that I have a love-hate relationship with. PETG has some great mechanical properties and when you get a nice print, it's very satisfying, but occasionally it can be a little challenging to work with because it likes to stick to the nozzle. And despite this challenge, I figure I'll scale the model up to 150% and just send it. So over in the material settings, I've selected generic PETG and in the print settings, I'm gonna change the quality to a layer height of 0.3 millimeters. I'm gonna have the outer walls set to two, the floors and ceilings at three, I'm gonna reduce the infill density down to 10% and select the lightning infill. I'll leave all of the default speed settings for this print. For supports, we're not gonna add any. And in terms of material, our material nozzle temperature will be 250 degrees Celsius with a build plate temperature of 80 degrees. I'll leave everything else as is. And the changes that I did make were only made in an attempt to reduce the print time because this is a very big part. I've read online that a lot of users have had success with the K1 and K1 Max using PETG with the stock profile, so this is what we're going to try. And if you guys are looking for this model, I'll link to it down in the video description below to give credit to the designer of this super cool low poly pumpkin skull. And because it's intended to be a pumpkin skull, I loaded up some bright orange PETG that I had laying around. And this is the first PETG print that I did on this printer. I did no practice runs. And to the credit of the K1 Max, it just worked. I was honestly expecting this thing to fail miserably because PETG can be a little bit tricky and because I used the lightning infill, which I've also had very little luck with in the past. This job took about eight hours and looked great considering that I did zero tuning and basically just clicked print. Successfully completing this print was a little shocking to me, especially because of the steep overhangs around the cheekbones. I thought for sure I would endlessly have to play around with the part cooling settings and speeds in order to get this to work. This inspired me to print a slightly more challenging part, in my opinion, from the same designer, and it's a bat skull model. And you can see where the teeth or fangs are at the front of the skull. Those start off as small islands with very steep overhangs as well. And this print also worked out perfect. I was fully expecting those front teeth to get knocked over and having to try this multiple times as well. But on the first try, the K1 Max knocked it out of the park. And in addition to the nice surfaces, both of these parts barely had any stringing whatsoever. And so with Halloween coming up, these two models will make nice additions to the Halloween decorations. The K1 Max has a LiDAR sensor mounted to the print head. And when this printer was first released, there didn't seem to be an abundance of information about how to use it or what it's even doing. And although this printer has been out for a while now, I still can't seem to find a lot of information on it, so what we're going to do here is just run a very simple test. Taking inspiration from my logo, I designed my own calibration cube and it has a bunch of different features here, including bridges, overhangs, 90 degree angles, 45 degree angles, some text, and a clearance section in the middle. I'll print one in PLA with some pretty standard settings and I'm just going to make sure that the brim is disabled. 
Technically, there's two parts here, and I want to make sure that the brim doesn't overlap one part into the other, getting any of these parts or the support material stuck together. If the printer's dimensional accuracy is decent and those prints come out with sharp corners, then none of the parts should get fused together. And so this simple part wasn't a problem for the K1 Max, and after the initial inspection, it looks like everything turned out quite well. Now this was done without the LiDAR or Linear Advance activated, so let's try that next. To activate the LiDAR and Linear Advance, head into the settings, tap on camera, then click AI function. At the bottom, you'll see Motion Advance. Turn that on. You'll see that it says supports Creality Print only, so I'm assuming it only works with files sliced in Creality Print. In the slicer itself, I'm working with the latest version, at least at the release date of this video, and in here I really can't find any reference to the LiDAR sensor. In the print settings, if you scroll through the material settings, you won't find any reference to linear advance, pressure advance, or the LiDAR sensor either. However, oddly in the search menu, if you search pressure, you'll find in the material section, pressure advance. Now, if you go to save that, and you return back into the settings and you head over to materials, it still won't show up in there. And if you search pressure again, you'll find it, but it doesn't look like it's saved. So I'm not entirely sure what's going on with the slicer and if you even need to enable anything in the slicer, but I just wanted to point out that it's a little odd. And so with the motion advanced enabled on the touch screen only, I'm gonna restart this print and it says laser scanning in progress. The LiDAR sensor appears to come alive and it will scan the sticker on the side of the print bed, which I'm assuming is some sort of calibration sticker. It will go through and scan the print bed itself, which I'm assuming is to establish some sort of baseline. And because of that, you can see I'm using the smooth side of my PEI sheet. And then it'll print a series of lines, scan those lines, and then the print starts. After scanning the series of zigzag lines, the printer should be able to compensate and make adjustments during the various different print moves and accelerations to produce the sharpest details. However, after reprinting this same part, not much changed. Comparing the two parts side by side, you'll see the first one was done without the scan and the second one here is with the scan. So the first one and the second one both were able to print without the two parts being welded together. And the first one here, you see all the details are quite nice. The corners are actually very sharp, both on the 45 degree angle and the 90 degree angle corners. So there was really no issues to start with anyways. The interior corners were also sharp. The supports came out nice. The small indentations in the part also look sharp. The supports were easy to remove and the bottom surface of the supported sections are decent. This first cube was printed on the textured side of the bed, and so you get the textured imprint on the bottom. Top surface looks very smooth. There's no over extrusion there. And on the interior part, the 50 degree overhang looks nice. 60 degree overhang also looks nice. The bottom surface, side surfaces, and the top also looks great, and the text looks sharp. The printer had no issues with 0.3 millimeters of clearance between those walls. The corners of the interior piece may look a little rounded, but actually they're just chamfered to ensure that the corners don't weld together. And what we're really testing here is the clearance between the walls. And this part here where the advanced motion was enabled looks more or less identical. The 45 degree angle, the 90 degree angles all look quite sharp. Small indentations look good. And there's no complaints on the surface quality of both the top, bottom, or sides. The only thing that came out worse in this part was that the supports actually failed and created a little bit of a mess, but otherwise everything looks identical. The parts are also dimensionally the same and also very accurate, and so my conclusion here is that either the LiDAR isn't really doing anything, or that the printer is very well calibrated from the factory, and that the LiDAR scan didn't have to make any significant changes. And so this brings me to my final thoughts on the K1 Max. And similar to the smaller K1, the printer performed very well overall, and I did enjoy using it. It was a mostly painless experience. However, I did experience two extruder jams during my time with this printer, and I made a separate video on how to unclog the extruder on the K1 and K1 Max. You can find a link to that in the top right-hand corner of the screen right now. Now, of those two times, one of them, I suspect it was just faulty filament. There was a bulge in the filament. It got stuck, and the extruder jammed up. Otherwise, all of the prints coming off of the K1 Max looked really nice, especially with Creality Print. 
Now, I wish I could figure out the secret sauce as to what they're doing in Creality Print to get the quality, uh, because I did make a Prusa Slicer profile, and although the results were very good, as you saw earlier in the video, they didn't quite line up with the results from Creality Print. Now, Creality Print, I hope that they continue to develop that software because again, the quality coming out of there is great, except it's lacking some of the more advanced features of Prusa Slicer or Super Slicer. Now, if you guys are looking for my profile, you'll find that on my website. I'll put a link in the video description down below. Like I said, it's pretty good. It's the best I could get closest to Creality Print. Uh, but again, if you guys are looking for the very best results, get used to using Creality Print with this machine. And so while we're on the topic of software, I have the same criticism for the K1 Max as I do with the regular K1. And I wish that Creality would enhance the web user interface because everyone knows it's running Clipper and we have the full fluid interface with the Sonic Pad, which is also a Creality product. But for some reason on the K1 and K1 Max, they give you this dialed back version on the web interface. Now you can install Fluid if you want, but you have to go through the process of rooting the printer. The good news is that recently Creality did release the files where you can do that on their GitHub page. So they've made all the open source files available, but it's still something that the user has to do themselves. I really wish Creality would just do that with a firmware update. And on your end, you wouldn't really have to do anything other than click update on the screen. Two more things I'm hoping for with this machine is that Creality releases more information about the LiDAR sensor and how we can work with that and optimize those results, as well as putting a live Z adjustment on the screen so that you can do some fine tuning on the first layer. I'm really not sure why this isn't a thing on the K1 and K1 Max. But overall, I think Creality finally delivered on its promise of speed combined with size. And given its size and large build volume, it's actually packaged quite tightly. So it will fit on your desk or even in a smaller workshop. They did a very nice job with that. And even the way it looks, if that's something that's important to you, it will look nice in something like your office. But the only catch is that it is quite loud. So if you are a person where the noise of fans does bother you, the K1 and K1 Max do produce quite a bit of noise. It's not something that personally bothers me, but I know there's a lot of people out there that are quite sensitive to it. And as with all Creality products, keep an eye out for sales because if you can find the K1 Max on sale, it's a great value for a high speed, large format 3D printer. And with the money you saved, you can put it towards some new upgrades like a real PEI flex plate and a hardened steel nozzle. And so that's it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I know it was a really long one, but that means it's a lot of work for me to make videos like this. And if you guys want to support me and my work, check out my website, embracemaking.com, where you'll find all of those upgrades for your printer so you'll support me and get something in return. And I would highly recommend that you guys go check out Creality and specifically the K1 Max. Big shout out and thank you to Creality for sending me the K1 Max for this video. It wouldn't be possible without them.